good morning and welcome to this uh, the 11th uh, edition of chaos uh, chaos stands for concepts actions and objects but some people who don't know how to spell in english uh, thought it sounded like another interesting word in english chaotic and uh, there's nothing chaotic about these meetings there's lots of discussion which is a great part uh, of uh, chaos. Uh, thank you all for coming. And um, I just have one brief announcement before uh, starting the day. One of the speakers, uh, uh, Tom Griffith, uh, will not be able to come. Um, he had uh, some injury to his arm, um, his nerve in his arm, and has to have surgery. And so he couldn't come. And uh, we have coerced uh, um, uh, another person to take his place. Uh, she usually travels with her slides, just in case she has to be coerced into giving a talk. Uh, Sharon Thompson Schill will uh, take uh, Tom's place. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a meeting that's been going on, as I said, for 11 years. It's, uh, it's a meeting that, that some of us are really excited about. Uh, it was started uh, 11 years ago. Um, at the time, uh, it was just four organizers, uh, Mel Goodale, Alex Martin, Brad Mahon, and myself. And then we realized that we weren't able to do this job properly, and so we recruited a few other people to, do the, to help us with the work. Um, um, Marius Pilin and uh, Sharon Thompson Schill, and I think it's everybody. I've not left anyone. Um, these meetings uh, uh, are planned uh, the, the last day of the meeting, uh, the last day of, uh, of chaos. We plan uh, next year's meeting, and we hope to do it again this year. The financial situation is not so great as it used to be a few years ago, but we're still going to try and see if we can schedule the 12th uh, uh, edition of chaos for next year. Um, uh, so if anyone has any good suggestions to throw away about uh, topics for next year, we welcome, pass them on to anyone uh, on the committee. Uh, I have no other announcements, I don't think. Remember the social dinner, but I think everyone is aware of that. Uh, remember the posters uh, that we have uh, downstairs, and also remember that there is uh, a, a, uh, a workshop planned um, in October uh, to celebrate the 10th anniversary uh, of foundation of uh, the Center for Mind Brain Sciences, CHIMEC. And again, you're all invited. I hope some of you can come uh, or send your students. Uh, there will be about 20 speakers I hear. Uh, I am not involved in their organizing, um, uh, but I've heard there are about 20 speakers uh, who have been invited and should be a fun meeting. So. Uh, uh, last bit of information, we're a bit late to start, I apologize, I've also been talking too much. Um, the, the, the speakers have 45 minutes and we'll try and hold them to the 45 minutes so that we can have half an hour of discussion. Um, usually the discussion is dominated by a few rather contentious people in the front seats. Um, I really welcome and hope that people in the uh, rows in the back, uh, speak up, put up your hands. Um, I'll be chairing the session, so I'll be looking for hands uh, out in the, the depth rather than the front uh, first, so please participate. Um, don't be embarrassed. Uh, uh, that's it. So the first speaker this morning is, uh, uh, comes, is an old uh, Chimek person, uh, Angelica Lignau. Uh, she's now a professor in uh, uh, in. It's not, the slide's not up yet. Royal, Royal Holloway University of London. Um, Angelica is, um, was my first postdoc here at Chimek. Um, a number of years ago, 10 years ago? 10 years ago. And uh, I, uh, I quickly uh, convinced her that she should change field, and, uh, and she did, and I learned a lot. Uh, she changed into something I knew nothing about, which was the best way to have a postdoc, because then I could learn from Angelica, and I learned a lot. So, Angelica, first speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yeah. Just need to put on my slides. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay. 
hope I won't get entangled in this cable, so that will be an interesting moment. Um, thanks. Um, so first of all, it's a great honor for me to talk uh, at this conference that I attended for so many years, and I'm very much looking forward. So um, today I'm co going to talk um, to tell you about the topic that uh, Afonso convinced me to study in more depth, the representation of actions in the human brain. So our, in, um, our life is full of actions, so um, we are able to easily recognize that uh, this action, that these different actions, even though they, uh, they are visually very uh, um, different, um, they all depict the same action. Is it possible to lower the light a bit? Because I think then it's easier to see the images. Could someone do that? No? Well, okay, let's, let's see whether this happens. So the important uh, point to notice here is that uh, despite the fact that uh, very different objects and very different agents are uh, involved in all these images, we, ha uh, uh, we don't find it difficult to see that all of these images refer to the same action, namely feeding. At the same time, uh, we uh, also find it easy to tell that these two actions on the top refer to another action in comparison to the, um, to the two images on the, uh, on the bottom, which um, you might describe as transporting something, despite the fact that the two images on the left have a lot of uh, uh, visual similarity and objects and uh, agents in common, uh, like the cow and the, the people here and the hay, uh, and the same applies to the actions on the right. So despite uh, similarity uh, in uh, despite similarity of the, the visual features of these actions, uh, we do not classify them uh, according to visual similarity, but rather to their meaning. And the question is, how do we achieve this task? Um, uh, one way to think about that uh, used to be that uh, uh, these uh, more abstract representations that general, uh, generalize uh, across uh, low-level aspects are represented in the motor system, in particular in the IPL and the ventral premotor cortex, whereas it uh, used to... Oh, that should have been read. Uh, uh, whereas we uh, used to think about uh, higher-level uh, early... Uh, yeah, the, uh, about representations in um, uh, visual and temporal cortex to uh, present a, a visual analysis of the, the action that does not necessarily uh, contain such generalization across features. So in the first part of the talk, I would like to present you a couple of studies in, we, in which we uh, uh, followed this up more closely. So uh, namely to find, uh, to I identify areas that contain such abstra uh, abstract action representations. So uh, the a specific aim here was to identify areas that are able to distinguish between different actions, but at the same uh, time show generalization across the way in which we perform these actions. Um, so I, I'm assuming that most of uh, the people in this auditorium are uh, familiar with MBPA. I'm just seeing uh, Jim Hexby coming into the auditorium that has been very influential in this field. So uh, what we uh, typically do when we're extracting information from an area of interest is that we're comparing the uh, amplitude of the bold response. And if you, uh, in this toy example, if we do that for two different actions, usually we wouldn't see a difference in terms of the uh, bold amplitude. However, we can exploit uh, the fact that there's information in the patterns of brain activity. And now we can uh, train a classifier to recognize those differences in the patterns and then apply uh, those uh, uh, algorithms to a new fresh set of data and ask the classifier whether the presented action is, uh, uh, corresponds to category A or B. And so this is the logic that we are using, uh, that we've been using in uh, many of these studies. That's why I introduced it here. So uh, the first study that I want to uh, pr uh, present to you is an, uh, a study that we carried out with Moritz Wurm, who's uh, sitting here as well, uh, here at CHIMEC. And what we did is we manipulated the action uh, which was either cutting an object or peeling an object, and we manipulated the object on which this action was performed, na namely uh, apples or potatoes. You see where we're coming from. We're living in Trentino. Lots of apples and potatoes here. And so what we did is, in a block design, uh, we presented participants with those videos. So they didn't perform actions. They saw those videos. And in different uh, blocks, they had to perform different tasks. So in the action task, they had to uh, press a button whenever the same action was repeated, 
Whereas in the object task, they had to uh, press a button whenever the same object was repeated. And the reason for that manipulation was that we wanted to see whether any representations that we're finding are there also uh, if we don't pay attention to the action or whether they are actually coming uh, about automatically. So uh, what we then did is, uh, as I said earlier, we, tr we, trained the classifier, we trained the classifier to distinguish between cutting and uh, peeling, for example, the apple. And now we did that uh, for two different levels. For the concrete level that is depicted here in red, is uh, uh, we trained the classifier to distinguish between the two actions um, on uh, the same object as the object that we used to train uh, to test the classifier. So train on the uh, apple, test on the apple, and so forth. Uh, whereas for the blue condition, the uh, abstract condition in this case, we trained the classifier on one object and tested the classifier on the other object. Okay. Okay, so what we then did is we picked, uh, uh, pulled out uh, the data from uh, the key regions uh, that you also typically see in the uh, in univariate analyses that is depicted here. So the typical action observation network con uh, consisting of the ventral premotor, IPL, and the LOTC. And within those regions, uh, uh, we, we uh, then examined the performance of the classifier. So I'm not presenting you here the amplitude of the bold response, but the accuracy of the classifier. And since we have to actions, uh, um, chance performance is 50%. So what you see here is uh, on the y-axis the performance of the classifier and on the x-axis the different regions of interest. And uh, in dark red you see the concrete conditions, so training and testing on the same object. And uh, the bri uh, bright red uh, um, uh, bars uh, correspond, oh sorry, the dark red corresponds to the action task, so when participants actually pay, pay attention to the action, whereas the bright red response, uh, corresponds to the object task when participants pay attention to the object. And what you see here in left uh, uh, ventral premotor cortex, both in the left and right hemisphere, is that you can distinguish between cutting and peeling, but only if you pay attention to the action and uh, only when you train and test the, uh, test the classifier on the same object. As, as soon as you move to the other object, or if you're not paying attention to the action, you can no longer distinguish between uh, cutting and peeling. So it's a, a rather concrete representation here. How about the IPL, or IRPS in this case? Uh, here you can see that in the left hemisphere, you can distinguish between cutting and peeling both when you're paying attention to the action and when you're pay, uh, paying attention to the object. So it's a generalization across the task, if you want. And in the right hemisphere, you can also distinguish between cutting and peeling uh, when you're training and testing the classifier on two different objects. So a bit more of a gen generalization here, whereas the highest uh, degree of uh, um, uh, generalization we, uh, we observed in the left LOTC where we found that no matter whether you're paying attention to the uh, action or the object and no matter whether you're uh, training and testing the classifier on the same or two different objects, you can distinguish between cutting and peeling. Okay, so that was the first step for us to think, hmm, okay, there's, there's something in here in the LOTC and we seem to see a gradient here from ventral premotor cortex uh, up to the LOTC. Can we actually see that also in other actions? Because admittedly, cutting and peeling is not a very wide range of actions, right? So we were interested in seeing whether we can replicate that in other actions as well. At this moment, I need to take a sip of water. If anyone has a question, it would be a good moment. No? Okay. So, how about other actions? So what we did next is um, to take uh, to move to other actions. In this case, opening and closing actions. And we uh, and put, uh, the videos uh, that we used were depicting actions that were uh, using two different uh, um, objects. So in this case, a bottle or container. And now the interesting thing was that uh, this allows us uh, allowed us to look into three different levels of representation. So in the most concrete, uh, at the most concrete level, what you see here in what I see as red is um, uh, the most concrete level where we train and test the classifier on exactly the same object. So that means uh, the opening and closing uh, not only perceptually was very similar, but also the kinematics were similar in the sense that uh, the, the same object required either a tilting or lifting movement. So both uh, visually and uh, in terms of kinematics, these actions were very, very similar. 
uh, at an intermediate level, um, wh what we did is we uh, trained and tested the classifier on the same object class, but on different examplers that required different kinematics. In this case, lifting the cap versus tilting. No, actually, this was uh, tilting the cap and this was lifting the cap, and we did it in both directions. So this would show a generalization across the kinematics, whereas the highest level that we tested in this experiment was to train the classifier on one object class, for example, the bottles, and test the classifier on uh, the other object class, in this case, the container, and vice versa. And again, uh, we asked the question, in which of these areas do we f uh, are we able to distinguish between opening and closing, uh, irrespective of, say, the kinematics or the object class, okay? So this is what we found, a very similar way of depicting the data. So here in left and right ventral premotor cortex in red, again, uh, the concrete level, so training and testing are not on exactly the same exemplars, but different uh, data sets, of course. Um, we can distinguish between opening and closing, but we cannot distinguish between uh, opening and closing if we vary the kinematics or if we vary the, the object class. Uh, if we go to the IPL, we can decode at all three levels, so both at the concrete level, also when we uh, uh, manipulate the kinematics and also if we man manipulate uh, the object class and uh, in the OTC you find the same but the classification performance uh, is even higher. So the trend is very, very similar to what you've seen in the previous uh, experiment but for different tasks and different or different stimuli and different types of generalization. So that made us confident that what we saw in the first study is replicable. Uh, replicable. Um, at this point, you might, of course, wonder, well, you're presenting us three regions here. Maybe you overlooked some very important areas. Of course, we also uh, did the same analysis using a searchlight analysis. And this is just to show you briefly that the black doesn't look very pretty, but OK. Um, <laughs> it is red on my slides. Uh, so the, and the important thing is uh, what you see here in blue and green is the abstract and the intermediate level, which you see here on the uh, inflated hemisphere of both, uh, uh, both hemispheres, is that there's really nothing at the intermediate and abstract level anterior to the central sulcus. So you essentially see it in the IPL and in the OTC that uh, essentially replicates what I showed you in the Roy analysis. And that, was, that is what we see across many studies. We've replicated this a number of times now. So. Um, uh, to provide you with an interim summary at this point, um, we see uh, a generalization across kinematics, objects, and uh, task in the LOTC. We see a generalization across kinematics and objects in the IPL. And no signs of generalization across these aspects in PMV suggesting a rather concrete representation in that area. So at this point, sometimes people ask me, so did you try that also for uh, movements that participants actually perform? And uh, so far, I always had to say, yeah, we're planning to do that. Uh, we don't know yet. But uh, in the meantime, we did that, thanks to Luca Turella, who's probably also somewhere here. Yes, there he is. So, um, um, so in the next project that I want to present to you, uh, we looked into the generalization across the way we, in which we perform actions for, for actions that participants actually perform inside the scanner, which for various reasons, uh, reasons is not straightforward. So Luca uh, spent a lot of time on uh, building this device here inside the scanner made of plexiglass on which he was able to um, uh, attach wooden objects that you can actually take inside the scanner. So thanks to Luca for figuring, figuring this all out. And so here's the start position where he can record the onset of the movement. And there's a camera outside uh, uh, the scanner board to record the precision of the, uh, the movement such that we really have a good understanding of what is going on inside the scanner. And now what he did inside the scanner is that, uh, or what, what we manip manipulated inside the scanner was the action. So participants either performed a precision grip on the uh, wooden object inside the scanner or whole hand grip. And uh, they d uh, did that um, with the right hand or the left hand. And they did that with two different uh, wrist orientations. So either with an upright wrist, wrist orientation or with a tilted wrist orientation by 90 degrees, okay? 
And now, uh, logically very similar to what I just presented to you for observation, we now looked at uh, different levels of representation here. So at the very concrete level, we trained uh, the data to distinguish between whole hand grip and precision grip uh, with one particular effector and one particular wrist orientation. And we tested the classifier on exactly the same. So the same wrist orientation, the same effector, uh, but on a fresh data set. So this is what we call the concrete level here. Uh, at uh, the intermediate level, we looked into the generalization across wrist orientation, so distinguishing between whole hand grip and uh, precision grip within the effector, but across wrist orientation. And the, at the most abstract level, we distinguished, uh, trained the classifier to distinguish between whole hand grip and precision grip uh, across effector and across wrist orientation. Yes? They did, uh, they did not see their hands. On purpose, uh, we uh, distinguished what they saw from, uh, w w we wanted to make sure that they did not see their hands because otherwise you don't know is, it, is whatever we are seeing a representation of their own seen hand or what they are doing and we wanted to dis dissociate that here. So they only saw the screen uh, above them and on the screen they had uh, a simple instruction of the fixation cross that indicated which uh, movement to perform. That was all, yeah, thanks for the question, good point. Okay, so just a sip of water. So what you see on the next slide, or on this slide, is uh, the um, uh, outcome of the concrete action decoding. So within the same effector and the same wrist orientation for the left and right hand, and what you see here is that there's a huge network of areas in. Uh, and both the left and right hemisphere where we, you can decode between um, uh, whole hand grip and, uh, um, and precision grip, which is maybe not that surprising. Um, the more interesting aspects of, of course, the intermediate and abstract levels. So this is what you see on the next slide. So th this is what you see uh, uh, when you're trying to decode while generalizing across the wrist orientation. So you see um, that this is possible for the left hand and parietal cortex and also in uh, premotor uh, regions and uh, a bit more for the right hand than uh, for the left hand, which is perhaps not that surprising. So you see that both in parietal premotor regions and a bit in the uh, occipital temporal uh, regions. How about the most abstract level? So uh, generalizing across wrist orientation uh, and factor. And uh, this might or might not be surprising for you, the highest generalization we find in the IPL and uh, the uh, LOTC over here. Uh, and this is more in the left hemisphere than for the right hemisphere, whereas there's very little going on in uh, 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 premotor and frontal regions. Um, Luca then had this uh, idea to also look for the, yes? Just a quick clarification, is that really LOTC or is that closer to LOTC? Well, it's at the very posterior boundary of LOTC, right? Yeah. We might, might discuss where the exact boundaries are because that's a gray zone, right? Um, but it's not frontal, it's not premotor. Um, <laughs> that for sure. Um, okay, so then, uh, um, what we did next is to look into the conjunction between these three levels, between the most abstract, the intermediate, and the, um, the, uh, the highest level of uh, generalization. And uh, this is what we found. So this is a conjunction between the most concrete level, so within the, the wrist orientation and within the effector in the left hand and the right hand. And here you find that the, the conjunction for these two levels uh, is found uh, both in the parietal cortex and um, uh, premotor cortex, both in the left and right hand. Whereas uh, the conjunction for uh, level two and three, so the generalization across wrist orientation and the generalization across wrist orientation and effector is uh, circumscribed here in, uh, in parietal cortex, but not in premotor cortex, which I get, again, I think uh, adds an interesting additional uh, description of these results. So a short recap on uh, those results. What we find in motor and premotor cortex for executed actions is uh, a joint encoding of concrete hand actions actions together with act abstract information about their goals, so irrespective of wrist orientation, but only within the effector, no generalization across the effector. Uh, whereas in the parietal lobe, we find uh, goal encoding within and across the hands. Uh, 
And uh, in uh, the posterior temporal cortex, we find an effector independent goal encoding, but no convergence between uh, the effector dependent, uh, with the effector dependent uh, goal encoding, right? Remember, it didn't show up in the conjunction maps. Um, okay, so um, if there are no questions on this aspect, I'd like to, brief, uh, like to uh, switch gears a little bit and uh, move on to a slightly related uh, topic. And uh, that is the question, can we actually distinguish between action functions and states of objects, right? So many of the actions that we're performing uh, do not only consist of the action itself, but also on the state in which we are bringing the object, right? So if you think of building a house, when you're building a house, at the beginning you have stones and uh, concrete, and at the end you have a house. So what is it that we're looking at here in IPL and LOTC? Is it uh, the function itself or the change of the state of the object or a combination of these? Uh, so, uh, more formally, uh, we wanted to see whether we can distinguish between uh, the representation of the function and uh, uh, which uh, changes an initial state into a final desired end state and the, uh, the states of the object itself. So, that's not straightforward. So, we spent quite a bit of time uh, during a, lab, a visit of Udi Zahari and his uh, postdocs we uh, wrote when we were still at Chimek, thinking about how we could best do that. And we spent uh, hours and hours talking about this until, until we came up uh, with the following. So, uh, we uh, performed two different experiments here in the same participants uh, uh, success, um, subsequently. So, what we did in the first experiment is we presented participants uh, with uh, static images of objects that were in a, a particular state. Uh, and the state that we chose was either open, so for example, this open dustbin, or close. Think of this closed dustbin, right? And uh, I'm going to show you uh, more uh, examples in a, a second. Whereas uh, in experiment two, we presented participants uh, with, uh, with videos. And in these videos, again, uh, we saw, uh, the, uh, we saw uh, similar objects. For example, an object that is opened uh, from a closed state to an open state, uh, or vice versa, from a closed state to uh, an, from an open state to a closed state. And we had two main conditions here in the uh, in this second part of the experiment, namely that um, the states of the object were either visible, in, uh, as you can see here, or they were invisible. So you only saw the uh, the uh, manipulation of the object, but you couldn't see the end state. You can, couldn't see the uh, uh, initial state, and you couldn't see the end state. You could only infer that, right? And so uh, we took uh, many different exemplars, uh, always of the same actions, opening and closing, uh, and we did them for, uh, took them from different viewing angles and in different contexts to make sure that we have a lot of uh, perceptual variability. And uh, so the logic was that uh, in order to uh, get at the key of uh, action functions, we trained a, a classifier to distinguish between opening and closing uh, in the visible condition when the uh, initial and end, st uh, uh, end state of the object were uh, visible. And we tested the classifier on the invisible condition when the uh, object states were not uh, visible. And we did the same uh, from invisible to visible. And the idea here was that uh, uh, any area that shows that kind of generalization uh, cannot be driven by the perception of the end state itself, because in the invisible condition, the end state is not, uh, not there. Um, so this is what we did for the uh, uh, functions, whereas for the object states, uh, we uh, tried to distinguish between uh, open and closed uh, still uh, images uh, for uh, training, and then uh, tested the classifier on uh, uh, the vi videos that showed the, uh, that showed the uh, uh, initial and end states, so the visible condition. And by, uh, we did the same, of course, in the opposite direction, and then uh, computed the, the uh, average accuracy. And um, I'm going to show you the searchlight analysis here in uh, green. So this is what we see for uh, the decoding from the visible to the invisible condition. So uh, a generalization across whether or not you see the uh, initial and the end state. And you find here again that uh, this in particular uh, reveals uh, the uh, uh, LOTC and uh, um, 
a little bit in the IPL, in particular in the right uh, hemisphere, whereas for um, the object states, you find uh, that we find this in uh, more uh, frontal regions uh, here at the level of the IFG. So, um, uh, that is, I think, an interesting dissociation between uh, functions and object states. Um, okay, this is what I basically just said. So, uh, we find a distinction between the encoding of action functions and the encoding of the initial object state. I'm, yes? Yeah, um, we. That, that would be nice to do, to be honest, and we, we've discussed this a lot. The, the problem is as soon as you do that, of course, you're giving up a lot of your power because you're using fewer data. For, with this particular data set, because there were so many conditions, unfortunately, we didn't have the power to do that, but it would be very interesting for a follow-up. I agree. Um, okay, so how am I doing with time, Alfonso? 20 minutes, okay, perfect. So that gives me time to talk about the third uh, topic, the third and last topic <laughs> of uh, my talk. So um, as I tried to uh, indicate at the very beginning of my talk, um, um, it is likely that uh, in order to show this generalization across the way we uh, perform, our, uh, perform actions, it's likely that we categorize actions. Very similar uh, points have been made for the re representation of objects, but uh, much less is known about uh, the categorization of actions. So what we did in this uh, uh, project that I'm going to present you now is to, to try to see whether we can distinguish between uh, key uh, action categories that are likely to, uh, to be present. And uh, what we did for that is um, we um, manipulated, uh, so we used uh, eight different actions, and what we uh, manipulated here was whether these actions were social in this, and the way we, uh, I, uh, we define social is, uh, was whether or not the action was uh, directed towards another person, as in the example of giving an object to another person or taking an object uh, away from another person, uh, whereas non-social were actions that were again pre uh, pre uh, performed uh, in the presence of another person, but the presence of the other person was not crucial for the performance of that action. In this case, opening and closing or closing an object. And the, the reason why we always had the other person uh, present is, is obvious because we didn't want to, uh, to have low level features uh, determining the distinction between uh, social and non-social actions, obviously. And we did that both for transitive actions, so actions that were performed uh, on an object object, uh, and on intransitive actions, in this case, agree, disagree, uh, and stroke, scratch, which was performed on the, uh, the actor's uh, own body. So we had uh, this two by two by two design, social, non-social, uh, actually two by two design, uh, social, non-social, transitive, uh, intransitive actions. Okay, and so uh, again, we manipulated uh, uh, a lot of the perceptual variability. So uh, we manipulated the position of the key actor. Uh, we manipulated the kind of objects on which these actions were performed. Uh, we manipulated uh, the viewing angle and we manipulated uh, the context. Uh, was performed either in an office or a breakfast context. And uh, so what you see here is uh, just also to show the relation to the previous uh, studies that I showed you. This is the multi-class decoding of all the eight actions against the, re uh, sorry, of each of the uh, eight actions against the remaining seven actions. And again, you see a very similar network of areas showing up as in the previous studies, indicating that what we saw before in the, uh, the other actions also generalize uh, for, for these other actions. Uh, and more interesting, uh, for, uh, for the question of uh, whether we can distinguish between different action categories is uh, that we carried out a representational dissimilarity uh, analysis. So for that, uh, Moritz asked participants after the experiment to rate each of these actions uh, on uh, two different scales, namely on uh, sociality and transitivity. So to the degree to which uh, another person was relevant to perform that action and the degree to which uh, another object was relevant to perform those actions. And from that, we were able to construct these uh, representational dissimilarity matrices uh, for transitivity and sociality. 
And now we were able to use those uh, behavioral matrices to see where in the brain do we find the highest correspondence be uh, between the neural dissimilarity and the behavioral dissimilarity. And uh, we did that focusing on the uh, lateral occipital temporal cortex. So what we see, what you see here, is a stripe that we extracted from that uh, that area. And now, uh, what you will see in a second is uh, plotting uh, the results as a function of the position on the stripe here. And in red, you see or. You should see um, the co um, correlation with the sociality uh, model, uh, so from dorsal to more uh, ventral regions, which peaks here in this more uh, um, dorsal portion, whereas in uh, blue you see the correlation with the transitivity model, which peaks uh, in a more um, a ventral portion at the... Oh, wait a second, I don't want to connect to iCloud, sorry. Um, okay, so you see uh, that this indicates uh, indeed a distinction between the, uh, the sociality model and the transitivity model. And uh, we see a very similar distinction here in the, um, the right uh, uh, hemisphere. And uh, if you plot that as a, uh, as a dendrogram, you see essentially the same thing, but visualized in a different way that the more dorsal portion of the LOTC uh, is organized accor uh, according to sociality, whereas the more ventral portion is organized more to, uh, towards transitivity, and indicating that there's in, uh, indeed this dorsal to ventral gradient uh, from sociality tra to transitivity. Um, so a brief interim discussion on that aspect. So I just said uh, we find this dorsal ventral distinction uh, of actions, and I think I don't have to repeat that. Um, so the very final project that I want to tell you is just uh, came uh, fresh out of the lab, um, and we've done that actually in London. So uh, the question we ask here, um, uh, our daily life uh, it consists of many different actions, perhaps even more variable than the actions I've uh, shown to you before. And they take place in many different contexts and they involve different uh, um, objects and some of them involve another person, others don't. And the question is, can we somehow depict the relation and the meaning between those actions while also accounting for the uh, manipulation or the, uh, the differences in all these other aspects such as uh, the context and the body parts that are involved and the objects that are involved. And um, that's of course a tricky business. So uh, what we did is um, we took, uh, um, based on uh, quite intensive pilot studies, we settled down on 28 daily life activities that most of us do on a regular basis. Uh, perhaps not dancing, but some of us. Uh, and uh, each of these actions we took uh, in uh, different contexts. Again, we had two different actresses. Uh, one of my PhD students here and one of my master students took lots of days uh, to take these photos. And uh, yes, uh, in different viewing angles and different objects. And uh, so we, again, we had a lot of uh, perceptual variability. And what we then did is um, we had uh, we used a technique called inverse multidimensional scaling. This has been uh, developed by Nico Krieger's quarter. So essentially, you're assigning uh, all the actions on a uh, on a circle. Um, on the screen, and participants have to uh, drag and drop these actions on the screen by, uh, with a mouse according to the perceived similarity, according to certain aspects. So uh, the most obvi obvious aspect that we used was uh, the, the, the similarity in terms of, uh, of the uh, meaning of these actions. But of course, you can do that also uh, with respect to the similarity according to the, uh, the movements that are involved, uh, the objects that are involved, the context in which this typically happens and the body parts that are typically performed. Now, naturally, these different aspects uh, go together. So I wasn't really expecting that they are clearly dissoci dissociable, but they should, uh, they should correlate, but they should uh, explain some slightly different aspects in different parts of the brain. What you see here is uh, the result, as, just as an example, of the semantic similarity now uh, across a group of 20 participants. And what you see here, it's perhaps too small to see, but I will show you in a uh, moment more clearly, is that they uh, attempt to cluster these actions according to meaningful categories. So this is a dendrogram plot of the same data that I just showed to you. And I highlighted here, oh, the colors are awful. Um, so I highlighted here the clusters into which uh, they fall. So this seems 
means here uh, like uh, clustering in t uh, according to uh, food related actions, body related actions, uh, relate, uh, actions related to leisure such as sports or reading, uh, um, then actions according to locomotion. So uh, participants uh, uh, use those categories to, uh, to assign the meaning. And the question is uh, where in the brain can we find a similar organization according to those ratings that participants made outside the scanner after the experiment. And again, similar to the project that I presented to you before is we did, uh, used uh, representational similarity analysis now using these different uh, models that I just uh, uh, talked about. And here's an example. Uh, result a searchlight analysis using the semantic model as a predictor and per it's perhaps not surprising to see this network of areas uh uh, uh, revealed by this representational similarity analysis and it's a bit pointless now to compare all those searchlight maps because I, as I said these um, models are correlated with each other but what, what we can do in each of these regions is to see which of the models uh, explain the data best and this is uh, the last uh, slide that I want to present on that project and here you see again I, I picked out the three key, key regions I talked about before the LOTC the IPL and the ventral premotor cortex and what you see here is that in the LOTC you find that uh, the body part model, so the similarity in terms of the body parts that are involved and the movement model and the semantic model and the object model all uh, explain a portion of the data, body and movement more than semantic and objects. Uh, we have not yet tried to break this down into smaller sub portions. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, if you look into a gradient inside the LOTC, these results also might uh, vary according to that. We haven't done that yet. If you uh, are wondering. Whereas in the IPL as a whole, what we see here is that the movement model uh, explains the data best, whereas in the ventral premotor cortex, uh, we see that the movement model and the context model uh, gives the best explanation. So this is where we are with this project. There are many more analyses uh, coming up for that. And uh, yeah, so uh, a brief summary on uh, that project. So we saw that uh, the LOTC shows the highest correlations with the body, movement, semantic, and object models. The IPL the highest correlation with the movement model and sorry and the PMV the highest correlation with the movement and context model um, so let's try to put that all onto a map to, uh, to wrap up what I talked uh, about so uh, what I showed in the first part of the talk is that I hope that I convinced you that we have good uh, reasons to believe that the LOTC and the IPL contain very abstract representations uh, both for observed actions but also to a certain degree for uh, executed actions whereas the uh, ventral premotor cortex uh, contains rather concrete action representations and this is what we see across a uh, number of studies. Uh, I've showed you data indicating that what we see in the LOTC and the IPL uh, uh, is more related to the function itself, whereas the ventral premotor cortex uh, uh, slash IFG uh, contains uh, or is more sensitive to the object states rather than the, uh, the function behind them. Um, and finally, when it comes to uh, action categories, I showed you this uh, gradient from uh, uh, dorsal to ventral regions uh, according to uh, sociality and transitivity. Uh, and I showed you uh, how different models uh, of, uh, explaining variability of these uh, different actions differed between the LOTC, the IPL, and the ventral premotor cortex. So um, what does it all mean with respect to the ideas that I presented at the very beginning? If we think of this initial model uh, that I presented before, that the generalization across the way we perform actions is how, uh, hosted in the motor system, if we put all these data together, I think this uh, explanation doesn't quite uh, hold. So uh, perhaps it is more realistic to think about uh, this, uh, this view, where uh, both the uh, ventral um, the lateral occipital temporal cortex and the IPL contain both concrete and uh, more abstract representations, uh, whereas the uh, premotor cortex and the IFG contain rather uh, concrete representations that are there to, for example, implement those actions, whereas the uh, uh, temporal, uh, uh, occipital, and uh, parietal regions might be there more to anticipate what the, uh, the best way of implementing those actions are given the perceptual input. And obviously, these areas uh, interact with each other, so there's for sure 
uh, more exchange about that. So where does that take us in the future? Uh, let me spend uh, one or two minutes on, uh, on this region that I talked about uh, quite a bit. So all of these areas indicated um, uh, a certain role of the lateral occipital temporal cortex, and that is perhaps not so surprising if you look at the literature from many different domains of many people also sitting in this audience, you see that uh, this area hosts a variety of different aspects. So it is concerned about the representation of basic motion, biological motion, it's uh, hosting two representations, it cares about body parts, it cares about the representation of hands, uh, Stefania Bracci has done a lot of research on that, it's involved in action observation, it is involved, uh, lately we've uh, seen a lot of data that it's involved in action planning. There are a lot of studies from Jason Gallivan on that. Um, we've seen that it also uh, shows uh, 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 up in the representation of action semantics and action verbs. So if you put that together, there's something, what all these studies have in common is that they all uh, cover different aspects that are relevant for actions, right? If you want to understand actions, you need to have a representation of biological motion, but you also need to have the corresponding semantics. This information needs to be integrated, right? And it's obvious, but we have a very poor understanding about how these different aspects that are relevant for action are combined in the LOTC. And that is due to the fact that we also have a very poor understanding about uh, how they, uh, they are arranged on a subject specific uh, basis. So th this is putting together P coordinates across many different studies carried out in different scanners and different participants. But I think what we need to understand is whether there is a, a, a consistent spatial relationship between these uh, different aspects to get a better understanding of how this information is uh, combined. And hopefully for the future, what we then can reach is if we think about the way in which we categorize different actions, is that we think of a multimodal uh, representation where we can describe which of these aspects are put together in order to distinguish between uh, different actions, um, uh, different categories that are perceptually perhaps very similar, but that uh, have uh, certain key features that are relevant for understanding those actions. So that is work for the future. And uh, yeah, I told you I'm interested in uh, studying this representation in more detail. I've given you uh, evidence for a gradient of sociality and transitivity. There's evidence in the literature indicating that there might also be a gradient from concrete to abstract representations, and there might be more. And uh, with this, I would like to thank for your attention. I hope you didn't fall asleep. And uh, thank you in particular for all the people that were involved in this project. Uh, thank you also for Alfonso for sometimes listening to me. And uh, uh, thank you for all the people that uh, made this work possible. So when you're viewing a, a visual scene and there's, it's, it, there's not really ever just one thing happening, right? So when people are transporting something, like in the picture, there's also things standing, right? There's um, people or, or animals looking around. If someone's giving someone an object at the same time someone's receiving an object, you can't have one without the other. So uh, what do you think is the role of these regions in, say, representing actions that are happening simultaneously like that? So just to make sure that I got the answer right, are you asking the question how we deal with the fact that in one particular scene there are typically quite a few different actions available? Or, yeah, or even yeah. the very same participants, like if someone's giving someone something, at the very same time someone's receiving something and you can't have one without the other. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Question and in, in fact, I mean, if you think about about object representations or scene perception, we have very similar problems, right? If I look at this uh, desk, it's completely cluttered, right? And in order to grasp my glass and rather than uh, the mobile phone, I need to to focus my attention on what I'm about to do, right? And I'm assuming that for actions, similar things happen uh, around you. There are people that are maybe falling asleep or can't be bothered, and but I'm focusing on you, right? So uh, regarding the uh, um, opposing actions, there might be something special about that, right? Because uh, certain actions have a counterpart that I might automatically uh, activate together with that action. So I think I would like to distinguish between 
the aspect of having many different as uh, actions in the scene around, which I, which I would assume is dealt with uh, with uh, selective attention and the uh, counter or opposing actions that I would assume we are co-activating when we are uh, activating that particular action. I'm just taking the opportunity. Thank you for this very rich talk. Um, I may have an old-fashioned question, but what, what do you think is the format of uh, these uh, abstract representation in uh, LOTC? Um, again, a good question. Based on my data, all I can say is it might be a very high-level visual representation. It must be high level because it shows all those generalizations uh, across low level perceptual features. But how far it goes beyond that high level visual representation based on my data alone, I cannot say because I haven't done yet the generalization across materials, right? So for example, from one modality to the other. Something I'm planning to do, but uh, I wouldn't want to lean out of the window to go beyond that. I would assume that once you're moving, uh, once you're doing a generalization across modality, that what you, uh, that what you see is more interior. But that I'm only speculating here. So uh, at least visual. I mean, something high-level visual. So yes. it means that we would move from something. So does it mean that it's also visual in a premotor cortex, or do you think that it's more, it's shift from motor to visual? Oh. What do well, you think? I mean, we know that premotor cortex has visual uh, properties as well, right? So it's hard, uh, hard to exclude that uh, premotor cortex has visual properties or shows these visual properties here as well. Again, I, I didn't do experiments to disentangle that. Um, what I think of, if you're asking about the way this is represented, I'm, I'm thinking of a lookup table here, right? So we have all these different uh, aspects, if you, if you think of this slide here, I know that the, um, the print size is very small, but what I think of is that uh, prototypical actions have certain features that uh, matter a lot or that are distinctive for this particular action, right? So riding a bike typically involves a bike. Running typically involves a certain uh, body posture. Eating involves uh, f available food. So I'm assuming that these aspects or the weighting between those aspects is represented somewhere, and this is what LOTC draws from, right? So, yeah. Mm. Well, I'm sorry, I'm taking over Alfonso's job. <laughs> Okay, hi. So um, I work in monkeys, and I work with uh, physiology in the intraparietal sulcus, and we look at attention. And we find, um, and what we commonly find in these neurons is a multiplexing of information about visual selection, which is attention and action selection. Mm -hmm. And I, so, and I'm developing a bit of a different view of those action representations in the parietal cortex. From what I see in my neurons, it doesn't seem that action signals are there in order to drive action or even in order to represent action or categorize it. They seem to be there in order to instruct the attentional system as to what to attend. Mm -hmm. Because as, as you just alluded with your, um, with your examples, uh, we don't know to what to pay attention to unless we know what we're doing. So there has to be this feedback. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on this. I know it's an unusual perspective, but it, I wonder yeah, if you have any thoughts. Thanks, thanks for that suggestion. I haven't studied that relationship yet between uh, action representations on the one hand and uh, attention towards those actions on the other hand. Perhaps the only example I can give you is the very first study where we uh, uh, specifically instructed participants to pay attention to the action or to the object. And what we saw there is that uh, in more posterior regions, it matters less, apparently. But we haven't done a careful um, investigation to really clearly disentangle that across those uh, different studies. And I think uh, you're right, uh, they, they must uh, somehow uh, act together, and at the moment I cannot clearly d dissociate them. I, I agree. Thank you for this really rich talk, and it, um, I actually have a clarification question because I was not uh, quite sure I, 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 I got the, the way you have um, um, separated social 
and transitive mm -hmm. because uh, well um, in taking is transit I suppose it's transitive because it's object directed mm -hmm. but it's also social yes while uh, a gesture is supposed to be intransitive however from a certain point of view if you think whether it uh, relates to a change of state. It's uh, communicative goals are different from instrumental goals uh, because they change the other's uh, mental states, but they're still goal-directed and in a certain sense instrumental. If that, but certainly uh, uh, there is a change of state, but especially in terms of the giving, taking versus uh, gesturing, agreement, disagreement, uh, I, I don't see the, the, um, how, how you can capture that in as transitive, non-transitive. I, I see your point and I agree that there are different ways of manipulating transitivity uh, and sociality. We were bound a bit here by our goal to have the stimulus material comparable across both dimensions and this is why we uh, why we went for this compromise. I agree that if, we, if you say only wanted to study sociality or only transitivity, then there would be more degrees of freedom of choosing those actions, right? I agree that the definition of sociality and transitivity is not necessarily what everybody would agree on what tra uh, depicts transitivity or sociality. So I, in that sense, I, I agree that this requires follow up, but I think it's a very uh, interesting first step in that direction to distinguish between two different categories and what they might be, we can define in more detail. Thank you very much for this very impressive work. Um, I've got a more fundamental question which does not only apply to your work, but I think to how the field currently develops based on this representational similarity analysis. So the question is basically, is it really useful to think about semantics in this sort of multidimensional ge geometric space, right? So I mean, it's even worse when you think about like animals and tools and then you need, then people are asked to rate on a scale between zero and seven how, how, how similar is basically a frog to a chair. Mm -hmm. So is that really that in our mind people have a dimensional space? I would doubt this, I mean this goes back to the work by Tversky and so on, having like more uh, a feature-based model, right? And also like, I mean Tversky already pointed out these ideas that actually if A is similar to B, not necessarily B is as equally similar to A and the triangular inequality and all these things. So that's why I feel actually this representation and similarity analysis might not be the most appropriate tool and approach to look at all this, both at the behavior level, doing this sort of um, similarity rating tasks, mm -hmm. and secondly, also when using the neural, um, neural representations, right? Just losing correlation analyses. I mean, I know later on you do like a clustering analysis on top of it, but it's sort of like that I think the field should maybe move beyond that. And also that even the tree-based clustering also misses out on certain things that, for instance, they are like multiple. So for instance, you can have like two superordinate categories that define a subordinate category. The tree-based clustering doesn't allow for this. So I was wondering whether you um, have some views on that. Yeah. Thanks for bringing up this topic because we've been thinking about exactly that topic uh, a lot as well. As you saw, the uh, models uh, explained a significant portion of the data, but not a lot, right? And that indicates that our models are, at the moment, a very poor description. So we're exactly doing that right now to look in more feature-based representations and see whether the dissimilarities that we're getting, first of all, are comparable to the semantic models and whether they cap capture the data better than uh, the semantic or the other models. Models. And it's too early to say it's, it's a very, very early work. That's why I didn't present it here. But I, I agree that uh, if we want to have a fuller understanding, we need to also uh, look at the more feature-based uh, um, representations. And whether that can, is, should be done with RSA or another method, that's, that's yet another question. I, I agree. Angelica, uh, beautiful talk. So, um, you know, you talked a lot about different levels or different types of representation, mm -hmm. but you also use this term of gradients, which mm -hmm. is becoming more and more popular. Um, and I just want to maybe get you to clarify what you mean, because one, you know, fMRI data is particularly uh, 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 apt for demonstrating gradients because we, you know, we have voxels and we average across it, so it's really conducive for giving us data that looks like a gradient. Mm -hmm. 
Um, also, the, the tasks that we use because of our inability to clearly separate out what you think is social versus transitive, for example, uh, also might give you some smearing. Um, versus the, the more, I think, important or deeper question about the neural organization. Mm -hmm. So, um, which, which, you know, if it really is a gradient at that level, that has really important and maybe profound implications for the way we think about brain organization, right? So, when you were using that term, what did you mean by a gradient? So, what I mean by gradient, and I'm happy to, to define it uh, in a term that perhaps is uh, more appropriate, is that uh, the representation of certain features varies across space in the brain. Whether or not there's uh, a categorical boundary or not, well, I cannot exclude that with my method, right? But what I do see is that there's a variation across space. So does that mean a, a mixing of features and properties? I would, I would be certain about that. Obviously, uh, with our two by two or two by two by two designs, what we see is the representations uh, of those features in that particular area. But I'm thinking about the LOTs. Well, I was going to use biological motion, for example. Yes. So um, we know there's a lot of evidence for posterior STS yeah. being particularly responsive. So in this kind of a view, you see those uh, uh, cells that are particularly responsive to biological motion being, what, smeared into middle temporal gyrus, for um, example? So so what I'm thinking of here is very similar to what Michael Graziano described in the motor and premotor cortex. I'm thinking of variable, or uh, various different gradients sitting on top of each other. I don't think that there's one particular area that is only doing biological motion. I think that these different patches are used for many different aspects. And in our experiments, we tend to see only those that we investigate, but they're used for many different things. You alluded to the cross-modal question, but I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. So just to make it concrete, if you, uh, again, have a person in here, sentences describing opening and closing, uh, you don't expect you'd be able to see any, um, you know, that this model would be able to pick that up in these LOTC regions? We haven't done that experiment yet, but I would be, I would be surprised if you wouldn't see it in LOTC, but in the more anterior portion. Wait, so that's two different things you're saying. So you're saying that it could be more anterior, meaning that it's where it becomes more modality independent. Mm -hmm. But would you also be able to expect to see it in the uh, areas that you're talking about today? Um, well, we haven't done that experiment yet. I, I would assume that there must be a transition phase where you, or a transition where, where you see both. And where, I'm thinking again of a, if you want, gradient, where you go from a more purely visual towards a more modality independent representation. And I'm, a, I'm assume, assuming that there's an intermediate stage where you have both. So they need to exchange information, right? Uh, I guess I think that the, uh, the feedback connections, though, might still, it's not a high bar here, yeah. right? In the sense that the classifiers are at like 54, 55% or right. something. So maybe you wouldn't see it because there's just so little window there yeah. to be able to detect yeah. that. Yeah. For that, I haven't shown, I, I think uh, fMRI is also limited when it comes to terms of uh, temporal resolution. So for this, uh, we need to also move more towards MEG. I think if we want to talk about connecti connectivity and uh, feedback, if you want. I see. So yeah. just to, one more quick thing. Yes. So if, if you don't see it in, uh, if you couldn't get there through the, uh, um, say, uh, auditory uh, modality, then I'm just trying to get a sense of what abstract visual might mean then in that sense, that you can pick it up that doesn't pick up abstract at the sort of right. modality independent level. Right. So what I think of as abstract but visual is uh, similar to what you see in the uh, object domain, that you can uh, um, represent, um, say, a bottle, irrespective of the shape of the bottle, of the size of the bottle, of the viewing angle, right? It's still, uh, it's still in a way, uh, visual, but it shows generalization. And I'm thinking of a very similar uh, features or properties uh, in the more, yeah, in the, in the LOTC that we show, the, that we see this uh, generalization across 
certain aspects of the action, but it might still be at a very high level, perceptual level. Thank you. Also, I agree with everyone. Great talk. Um, I, I think I might have a question related to riches, which has to do with this notion of abstractness versus concreteness. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, another possibility, I think language researchers sitting in this audience might interpret your data very differently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be, um, that in other words, it's not necessary that you're getting some kind of abstract visual notion or movement-related notion. It could also be that some of your results, at least, are driven by inner speech or, um, or semantics in the sense that it's not, you used visual stimuli, but of course the big test will come when you do a similar experiment mm -hmm. using uh, you know, uh, language-related stimuli. Um, so things are not driven visually. Um, so that's one point is about the posterior, the quote, abstract yeah. representation. Are people saying bottle to themselves? And then the question, of course, it, it begs the question of, well, what, what are they thinking then? Are they thinking of some kind of uh, uh, canonical bottle-like thing that, that would yeah. describe all bottles that yeah. they've ever, ever encountered? How, how embodied is that, you know, is sort of what we're, we're getting at. And then with regard to the PMV representation, um, I think some people might at least say that what you're getting is not concreteness per se, but you're getting a more highly high level of specification requirements, selection requirements. Mm -hmm. So you're having to narrow in and you're driving your semantic network to pick out uh, one thing which is going to drive that network. Now, of course, you might argue, well, that's not supposed to be PMV, that's really supposed to be IFG, but it's, it's mm -hmm. so proximal to that that yeah. maybe that's what you're getting. Rather than yeah. abstract to concrete, you're getting sort of more general to more specific. I, I would agree with in, that. In a selection be, sense. Yes, I yeah. would agree with that, and I would be happy in even using those terms. For me, I, I'm using abstract and uh, concrete here in the, in the way of general in terms of general, shown generalization versus being specific, not showing that Okay, I just think it's very important to be really specific about our yeah. terminology because abstract means something really different mm -hmm. to, to, you know, it, it really is a claim. So that's, that's all, just be, yeah. just be careful. Okay. okay. Um, what's that question? Um, I want to follow up on the abstract, yes. <laughs> uh, um, uh, in the way you defined abstract, which was uh, generalization, you know, representation that generalizes across different shapes and sizes and so on. So when you went through the first several data slides um, and you looked on the, you know, the areas that were on the right of the slide, like uh, lateral, occipital, temporal, yeah. um, uh, in addition to seeing generalization um, that you refer to as evidence of abstraction, in all of those slides you also saw that in the concrete it was greater, right. right? And so there's two non-mutually exclusive formats that could get you to that result. One is that there are commingled concrete and abstract representations of the information there. Mm -hmm. And the other is that, that the, action, the abstractions are actually more similar to one another when you have the exact same object than when you don't. And I was wondering which of those is, um, and if it's the former, these kind of commingled concrete and abstract representations, what, what you think that says then about the, what, how abstract this actually is? Um. Ah, yeah, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, I'm not sure if I, if I have an answer to what, I'm not sure if I have an answer to which of these two uh, um, solutions uh, that you just proposed it is. Um, if I think of the information that is host in, in this area, I, uh, I'm assuming that if we think of a communication between LOTC and IPL that has been shown in previous studies, that it is helpful to have both a concrete or say, let's use the term specific, that you have a very specific description of this particular bottle, if you, if you plan to grasp it, this is the size of uh, the, uh, the lid, and this is what I would do with that. Um, at the same time, to also have a very um, general description, if you were to grab any bottle, this is how you usually manipulate bottles based on my previous experience, right? So I'm more thinking about the two representations sitting next to each other because we use them for different purposes. One for the more theoretical aspect of I'm seeing a bottle and how do I normally manipulate bottles and that's something you might co-activate in case you decide to manipulate it. Whereas uh, in comparison to a very concrete case where you 
plan to grasp that specific bottle and you really need to provide uh, the parietal cortex with uh, an instruction, look, I think this is what you should do. And the parietal cortex then uh, uh, recruits those motor programs and uh, sends it uh, to premotor cortex. That, that would be my, my uh, reasoning about uh, your question. Well, whether it's the same population or to overlapping populations, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, that requires more studies, I would say. But interesting question. So your thinking about these action representations, both in terms of what the person needs to do to plan action, um, and you're thinking of recognizing actions in that context, and obviously that's a good way to think about it. Mm -hmm. But there's another way of thinking about representation of actions, which is just in terms of explanatory understanding, mm -hmm. so that you can predict or, or explain. Um, and a way of separating those two is to look at the representations of actions that people can't do at all, mm -hmm. right? So we make sense of animal actions, we make sense of you, you know, imaginary actions of imaginary alien beings that we can't possibly do, but yet we still can explain them and represent them. And I wonder, and, and this has to do with the necessary the necessary, necess whether it's necessary that, that the representations of actions that guide our categorization of them um, are embodied in the way that, that um, of course, the, the actions that we can do um, are, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, have you considered at all um, looking at the representations of actions of like, like I don't know, spinning a web or, um, um, I mean, you know. I, yeah, no, I, I haven't done that. I, I agree with you that that would be a very interesting distinction uh, to, to add. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of data that uh, Alfonso collected together with Jill, uh, Van Korp on uh, participants that were born without their upper limbs, right? And it's very unlikely that they, are, they have developed motor programs for their own arm movements in the lack of arms, right? And yet, uh, as they have shown uh, in a number of studies, is they have no difficulties recognizing or predicting movements of the arm. So I would take that as evidence, at least for those movements, that um, perhaps it is not a requirement to simulate those actions. It might be different for more complex actions like playing a violin, but uh, at least there's evidence against that. Yeah. So um, I just want to follow up on um, Alex's question and this notion of gradient. So. One can imagine a functional gradient, like we've been talking about, if there, there might be levels of abstraction and there's a kind of gradient that way. And one can also think of anatomic gradients, which seemed like you were suggesting. And um, the question is, when, do those, when does one gradient map onto the other and when not? And I'll do this by a silly analogy, which is in Philadelphia, Independence Hall has um, is where the initial Congress was, and representatives of the 13 colonies sat in an analog representation, which is, you know, the Northeast was over there and the South was over there, and so they're representing their analog states and they're representing it in an analog fashion mm -hmm. in Congress in a way that currently Congress no longer does that. And so the question is, when a functional gradient also maps onto an anatomic gradient and when it doesn't, what's at stake? So, again, I cannot, based on my current data, answer that question because I haven't done the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the analysis of uh, anatomical connectivity and functional connectivity. That's, that's something we're working on right now. And I would assume that, uh, I'm thinking of the anatomical connectivity as the highway system that we're exploiting uh, using uh, task-based activity. So I'm assuming that the anatomical connectivity gives us what we're 
well, the functional connectivity in a way then tells us how frequently are we using those highways, right, for certain tasks. So for me, they, they go hand in hand, and that is exactly what I'm planning to do for the LOTC, to study uh, both functional and anatomical connectivity. I don't think that it makes sense to only interpret functional connectivity without under, uh, also looking at the underlying anatomical connectivity, knowing that functional connectivity measures uh, using fMRI are also uh, quite variable and, yeah, error prone. I don't know if that answers your question. There were other questions, but thank you very much for all the questions. I just wanted to make one last question, comment. Um, I think that what has come out, aside from the beautiful empirical work you've been doing, uh, perhaps the most interesting aspect, even the discussion, was what models do we have? And no offense meant, but we don't have any good models. I agree. Uh, we don't have any good cognitive models. Mm -hmm. People are talking about the brain perhaps prematurely. That is pointing to parts of the brain that do this and that is interesting, but we have to have a correspondingly clear analysis of the cognitive processes. So what does abstract mean? What does concrete mean? What does action mean? What does, and it seems to me, and again, no offense meant because I do the same thing, we just have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, so so if, if, you, if you, at least if you look at language, you can say, well, we can piggyback on the linguists. They, they are trying to, they are struggling, trying to come up with some computational analysis of language which we can borrow, perhaps it's wrong, perhaps it's got all kinds of limitations, but it's striving for an articulated view that makes sense of the components that it uses. That is, it has a vocabulary. We don't even have a vocabulary. So when we talk about visual representation, we have no idea what we're talking about. No visual scientist can tell you what he means by visual representation other than it responds to visual stimulus. Now that can't be enough to have a theory of action. So many of the comments that were made are perfectly fine. I don't think they're directed at you as much as at us, the field. So I think that we can take this presentation today, which I think was great, I agree, it was Thank a beautiful you. presentation, really as, 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 as a warning signal. All this beautiful empirical work, for what? This, are, are we going forward to, make, to making a real articulate theory of action representation? And, and this really requires an integrated approach. It can't be left to the neuroscientists. They have no idea what it means to, to act. Nor does it leave it to a cognitive scientist who has no idea what the brain does. I mean, so I'm, I'm not trying to, to say one side is good, one side is bad. What I'm saying is that to do this kind of work, we have to do the hard work of trying to develop the theories. Thank you very much for a beautiful presentation. Thank you. We have, we have coffee break, we have coffee break, and please come back by uh, 11.15 or thereabouts, not much later. <laughs> Sorry? And post, and post a session, thank you, and post a session. <laughs>